Okay. Uh, thank you all. I'm, I'm glad to be here this year. I actually, I won't get into the story why. I tried to be here last year too, and I couldn't be. Um, and, and, you know, the talk today and in the hallway and else, you know, there's a lot of ideas in this. We want to talk about blue sky. And I think kind of what blue sky is doing what we wanted to do 20 years ago, that is to get all the electronic data that's somewhere else into our record. That's still blue sky. So I'm going to kind of be down at that level. Uh, also, there's a lot of great ideas of how we could do this and do that and uh, lots of things because now we got computers and computers are closest to a talisman, the magic that we got anywhere. And I want to re remind people of, or suggest a book to people. It's called Wicked Problems, Righteous Solutions. It's a little small book about software engineering. Um, well referenced and, and readable if you skim. But the principle, what they define as a wicked problem is any problem that's never been solved before and or it has a human in the cycle putting data in. Those are wicked problems. And, and they're right. The healthcare stuff, where the, you know, we, I've been in medical informatics and doing record systems for decades. And uh, a company would come out with a perfectly designed product. They engineered it. You could see everything's worked. And you put a person on it. It takes an hour. And they got to be done in five minutes. You know, it, that, that dimension of time is completely left out of our thinking. And it's, pre, it's prime in the whole process. So when we, have, when we talk about some new things, such as consents, it's a wicked problem because we aren't doing it systematically. And it's a wicked problem because there's a person who's not part of the workflow now doing something with that process, namely the patient. So be cautious about what you think we can do in the next, in, in the blue sky period. We may need to be talking about above tree level period for a while. And then maybe someday we'll get to 5,000 feet and then later, but, but, but be aware this stuff is hard. So now I started out, uh, I actually wrote three different talks and I've kind of filled with them. And I don't know what I really ended up with, so you'll have to apologize. <laughs> Uh, but I have, have to do my disclaimer, which the ideas and positions expressed here are my own and do not necessarily represent those of NLM, NIH, or HHS. In fact, they probably don't represent those <laughs> positions. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today a little bit is the evolution of EMRs from, I'm not even sure I'm going to talk about that. Wait a minute, I better put my glasses on. I'm going to talk a, a, a bit about the relationship of meaningful use regulations and the benefits to HIEs and, and the two studies that we've done. I'm going to start out with sort of the, the picture that I think we've all had. In 72, 1972, when I started building a record system, I had three hopes. Clinicians would have instant access to all their patients' medical data in an electronic record. And in more information means better choices and better care. And with all the data, they could put you know, guardrails on the care, and that would be called decision support today to keep things from going wrong. And then better, better data would be available across patients for research purposes. And, and where we are today, I think within hospitals, we're close to that now. Uh, HL7 version 2X was the enabler. So the data is pretty well connected in hospitals. Doesn't always need HL7 anymore, but it certainly did at the beginning. And there, there was a, a hospital, I, I come from Indiana, and I was involved in the IHE there from the beginning. And uh, we, um, there was a hospital that declared they're going to have one vendor. And when I left, we could count 50 systems they had in addition to that one vendor. Lots of little bitty systems, but they just keep springing up like mushrooms. So there's always going to be HL7 in a place for it. And a key ingredient to HL7 success was the fact that institutions could use or enforce the use of one, of a, one set of identifiers across these systems. That is, what's a glucose? What's a chest x-ray? What are these things we're passing around? And that's actually a tough, a tough problem. I have a wonderful assistant who's kind of guzzied up my slides with these pictures. Uh, I don't know exactly what they mean, but they're pretty. So, uh, <laughs> but, but the success in the hospitals you know, kind of falls short because it doesn't provide, and we've heard this already, you know, there's a lot of different places providing data. You don't get it all in the hospital, uh, and it doesn't help any of the care. So the record is really divided into many clinical care sites and settings. And, We've got a Humpty Dumpty model here. But we think we can, not like the king's horses and men, we can put Humpty Dumpty together again and with HIEs or some, and that kind of technology, health information exchange. And I think if you step back, it's the only reasonable way to do it. And either that or we get one great big company that runs healthcare, I guess. Well, I won't go there. Uh, but I mean, the companies are evolving. You know, one buys up another, buys up another. But they still end up with separate systems for a long, long time because of all the old stuff they have. Um, so uh, 
So based on the prescriber's name, the average patient may have as many as 4.3 different providers a year. We've done a we looked at this in drugs in, in Washington, uh, most with separate care systems. Over a three-year period in Indiana, 2.8 million patients visited ERs an average of 2.6 times, and 40% of them were different places with different information. That is, they visited a place, and there was another place that had information about them. Again, this is I'm waving the flag for each health information exchanges. Another pretty picture. Uh, and the data you know, is, is often somewhere else. So 48% of upper income and 37% of a smaller one in the last year also changed doctors in the last year. And HMOs, when they were more prominent even then, there was big turnover, 20%, 30% a year. They, they didn't have all the data. And just simple things, like you want to do a flu shot reminder, patients get a third of their flu shots outside of the office practice and hospitals, not to mention there's many of them. Uh, that 15 percent from their from pharmacies there's something screwed up here and 18 percent from the workplace or the other way around and the average patient has four visits a year half to primary care and half to one or more specialists and they don't connect in many settings so that just to make the argument we need to pull it into one unified whole I don't think I got to sell that idea and this is just again sort of uh, redundant but this is one choice connect everything to everything <clears throat> and with the internet I guess that's <clears throat> that's possible but the other choice is to connect everything to one thing, the HIA, at least within a region. And this comes from a paper um, from uh, Don Simborg and maybe West. Were you on this paper with the n times n minus one? Well, anyway, this is for a different argument. But if you have that everything connects to everything, you get, uh, you get, let's see, this is not right. If, yeah, if you have every, if you have, you get n times n minus one, which is a big number, but if you have, a connection to a single thing, you only have uh, end connections. And for Indiana, which has 138 hospitals, if you only thought about the hospitals, the everything to everything is 18,906 connections. And actually, there's more than one connection per hospital as it is now. There's, I think, somewhere on the order of 2,000 connections in Indiana to get those, those, all those places in. And within HIE, you can, you can imagine it's 138. Um, and to make all this work, we need standard structures, and that's HL7. And to me, it's HL7 version 2. Because that's all I've ever seen all life long. All these other things are fantastic moras. I mean, oh yeah, we got version three, you got version nine, you got version six. Show me one, you know. I, I, I mean, they're about a little, they're little only funny ones here and there. But CDA, I think, is real. Um, so message standards are available for shipping this around. And to make this work, you need standard codes to identify the information. Now, I don't think you have to code everything. I will never code everything, and we shouldn't code everything. But you at least have to have labels on the pieces of information, like a report, so you know where to put it. And you can put it with the other ones, and you can compare the previous one with the last one. And so that's sort of the minimum. And with standard vocabularies and codes uh, for, for representing uh, data that's not simple numeric, I don't know what I'm saying about that. I think that was a, a lost slide. So what we found in Indiana, anyway, it takes a few days to actually tie up. HL7 is not perfectly standardized. It's usually a couple days to twiddle it and make it work right. The really tough part was pulling in lab results and other things. But labs were the worst because a hospital might have 3,000 distinct tests. And that's a three to six month project to map those things because lab names aren't complete. They don't know what the tests really are when you talk. I mean, there's a lot of, some of you know where that is. So. Um, Ankh has come to the rescue on this. So meaningful use, at least, is starting to help with some of the problems uh, next year. We hope it'll all happen. So um, the standards, Ankh clarified what code systems to use for what concepts. Uh, there's a vocabulary task force meeting, which I've got cited here at the bottom, if anyone wants to look at it. It says, LOINC is the code for all clinical observations, reports, surveys, and measurements. So think of LOINC as the question, SNOMED CD, for coding problems, the answers to most like multiple choice questions, and lots of other things, procedures, lots of other things. Think of SNOMED as the answer, an RX norm for coding drugs and drug allergies and, and, and uh, other kinds of allergies. They slipped in the latex and a few other things, <clears throat> so it was easy enough to put them in the same field. Uh, and this is the document we're not gonna, um, I gotta click on it more than one time to get through. <clears throat> now all of these standards are supported by NLM, so I'm bragging a little bit, that's where I'm from. And there's links there if anyone wants to go. And you can get in there and play with things um, through those links. These slides are, are available on tape, I'm assuming. <clears throat> and MU2 requires by regulation more or, or less, but requires it very, very strongly, uh, along for individual lab tests across a, a spectrum of things and for a small set of clinical measurements. Uh, SNOMED CT for answers to categorical lab observations, problem lists, surgical procedures, and a few more and CVX, which is CDC's code for immunizations, and RxNorm, as I already said. 
Uh, and these rules actually go a long way to filling the gap. We got a standard you can ship around, but you got this huge problem of trying to map stuff. And if you don't have a, identifiers on them, it becomes like throwing stuff under a shoebox, and it's not that helpful to clinicians who are trying to look up stuff. Um, but the, and there's been a virtuous feedback from even the announcement of what's happening or is going to happen with Meaningful Use 2. So <clears throat> Meaningful Use 1 actually created the eScript standard. I mean, effectively, it, it required it. <clears throat> and I mean, it didn't make up the standard, but it, it introduced it and made it happen. And so everybody now accepts Rx. And now it's added Rx norm to the available codes within in East prescribing. So that's another virtuous result. <clears throat> and receiving laboratories, uh, referral labors, laboratories have used LOINC for a while, at least some of them, but now and meaningful use has kind of stimulated lots of them to look at it. And the instrument vendors are now really kind of running all over the place trying to get LOINC codes. We've worked with four of the big vendors, the big international vendors, Siemens and uh, um, Abbott, and let's see, I get, they've changed names. Ortho is Johnson & Johnson, it's Ortho um, and Beckton Dickinson, and to check their mappings. So, and there's eight of them, I'm told, all have mapped going to their, so that, that will help the, hosp the hospitals who don't know how to map, the little hospitals. I mean, they almost don't have personnel now. I don't know if, you, a lot of these labs are nearly lights out labs in a small hospital. And so, what this will help will, that they will get from the referral labs the codes to use for stuff they do a send out, which is a lot of their volume, and they'll get from their instruments the codes to use for the standard test. They'll still have to work with, there'll be some things they'll still have to worry about. So, <clears throat> So the more widespread use of coding standards, I think, will solve many of the challenges of HIEs. What makes them really hard is this, all this mapping work and the cost. And I think that's also true of installations and in, in doctor's offices. Um, so there's two, I'm, gonna, this, I'm kind of jumping over it. And, uh, these are two asides I'm going to give you. So uh, I want to comment on a paper that um, Adder Milstein in Nanos Internal Medicine sort of dinged HIEs. I don't know if you guys read it. Can, oh, man, you know. They only have 30% are only paying their own way, and 30% are treading water, and oh, this is just terrible. But they never compared that with what would you expect from a business startup. And it turns out that if, if in a typical business startup, 90% are gone in five years. It's not, the, I mean, you got most of them, they're looking at, we're still there. Not only that, the, 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 the uh, I don't know, these are cute pictures, but the, how do you like that one, that telephone? But, um, they, these are net, network economies. I mean, that's what this is. When you get everybody connecting in a region, it's, everybody else wants to connect. If you started, a, if you invented the telephone, you know, 70 years ago, when it was, it goes, hey, you want to buy a telephone? You, they say, what for? You know, well, you can talk to people. Who can I talk to? Well, you'd be the first one. So, you know, no one's going to buy it. And so you have this, you get this S-shaped growth curve, and it takes a while. And that's why people paid all that money for Yahoo, although that was, mis not, not Yahoo, for, um, Facebook, you know, they weren't making any money to that they knew about. I guess they are now. But if your network is going to pay off sooner or later. So this is a long-term deal. And with the acceleration, with the right regulations, the, the, the cost uh, barriers, the potential barrier in the chemical reaction goes down. So I think, I think it's, got, it's, it's the only thing that really makes sense, to my mind, anyway. Now, one other aside, there's a featured uh, length documentary film is being made about HIA. I don't know if you all know about that. So I don't know where it's going to show, at the art theaters, you know, or at the big, the big theaters, or just on TV. But if this was orchestrated by Kevin Johnson, who's the chair of medical informatics at Vanderbilt University. And I, I don't know, I haven't seen it, but you can look at trailers if you look at these things. And he's, this is really to sell HIAs to the, to the common man or the common woman. They go, you know, hey, put your dad out there so you can get it when you're sick or whatever, something to that effect. But it, it could be interesting. Now, I want to talk about two studies we've done in the last couple of years at NLM that I think might be relevant. I'm going to make it <laughs> try to make them relevant. So the first was a study of utility of the SureScripts uh, National Prescription Database uh, in an emergency department. So what we did is we hooked up the ER, uh, the ER to, well, we put a system in, hooked it up to the registration system, hooked the other side up to SureScripts, actually through registry. It was a long, that's a long, complicated story. But so we'd get every registration message into this little system, then it would put together, send a message out to SureScripts. SureScripts sends out to many systems of itself. They would come back in and it would, it would wait a while till it got enough of them, then it would try again if it didn't get any, and it was, it was a fairly complicated system. But it made a, a, a prescription form that looked like this. This is what we, we provided to the, to the, to the practice. And, 
This is important because the, the raw one does has a list, but it doesn't have the time frame. The time frame is produced by just a whole bunch of time events. And you can kind of see at a glance things like, man, why is this patient not on their hydrochlorothiazide anymore? You know, I mean, you can, you can see things that would be useful in terms of compliance problems or, or whatever. Why are they on two drugs? Um, and the results, of, all we did with the study, though, was to, to compare. We ran it for three months, pulling the data down, saving it all, pulling stuff out of the suburban hospital system, saving it all, linking them, de-identifying them, and then getting them over to NLM where we could analyze them to see how well SureScripts does in this hospital compared to the manual prescription writing. And it's, it's, it's good and bad. I mean, so there's positive and negative. So it was faster. It took one second on average to get the records in. It took uh, five minutes to get the first layer of the triage prescriptions in, but that was reviewed by pharmacy which took four hours, two to four hours to get done. Um, it had more complete drug names. 20% of the manually entered ones were just the name of the drug, but not the five milligrams or the, whatever the other details of it was. And the pharmacists were absolutely like in, in love with it. You know, they said they could now do med reconciliation and they were always finding stuff the patient was on that the patient didn't report in their history. Um, now, the, the, the good thing was that when SureScripts had a single drug on a patient, it had 88% of all the drugs we could get from both sources, uh, and more than they got from the manual history. And we verified that by, some, uh, by the pharmacists looking to see these were really real drugs. Uh, but SureScripts had no information on 40% of the patients. So that kind of reduced its value from when you, you just couldn't change over to it. Um, so now the implication of HIEs, HIEs could do the same thing. They could get all their practices to send in all the drugs and make up their own profile and do the same darn thing. Alternatively, maybe they could stimulate the, the regulated folks to encourage a, either a larger consortium or more consortia that they could all, they could easy to make a system to merge them together. So they're just, we should be getting all these drugs. They're there, they're electronic, they're computerized. And many of the missing ones were governmental sources, like you know, VA and um, DOD's insurance plan that didn't, didn't participate and uh, some Medicaid plan. So anyway, so that, that's, that's one thing. The second study is effective EMRs and provider efficiency. And this has implications, and this is back to the wicked problem. You know, if there's a human in between, they have to get home sometime to see their family and sleep and maybe even have to eat sometime. And if we don't forget that, we're gonna blow the system apart. So most time motion studies of individual data entry have reported slower with electronic processes than without. But these didn't account for the likely benefit of having all the data there. You know, that's gonna be great. And, and in fact, in my experience, physicians love that. And, um, but one large time motion study of the overall effects suggested there was no cost. It came out as a wash. Uh, they came out even. They just did in-clinic data, though. And there was a survey in that study that the physicians reported they were working now at home doing some other documentation. But that wasn't emphasized in the paper. So we hear lots of complaints. And I was at a party, uh, my brother's house, where he's in, a, I won't name the city, but it's a big hospital system with a fully computerized thing. And my brother was bragging about me as being the guy that had a lot to do with creating medical records. And she came over and thought of me as an enemy. And she was really angry. You had to do it, I don't even see my baby. And it was true, she, was, she had a newborn and she wasn't getting home to see the baby and she, she got emotional about it and I kind of ran away. But, but, <laughs> but there's a lot of, I hear this a lot of places. You know, I go to meetings, so, uh, and there's a chairman of medicine who told me you can't get guys to work in the clinic anymore because you just, you know, there's all this extra overhead. So, but I don't, is it really a problem? So we did a small survey in the place where my brother works, nine family practice physicians, and uh, they had two or more years experience with the computer, so these guys weren't just starting out. And the question we asked was what, the effect on their free time, not on their time in the clinic or how many patients they saw or whatever. They reported 46 minutes on average of free time loss per clinic day <coughs> since the, the MR started. So they were doing a lot of work at homes and at weekends and only with nine subjects, this was a significant, statistically significant result. One person said it saved them time. Uh, but um, now this is the, we, we had, this is just a small study in one place. So we got, a, we got the American College of Physicians to help us with a larger study. We got 410 physicians from around the country, uh, 410 out of about 800 who were invited responded and we still don't know what the letter said to know whether they were encourage only people to who use an electronic record to, to, to tie, tie in. So we asked a qualitative response on the ER on their free time. 59 said 
there's less or much less free time since the EMR. 36% said no effect, and 15% said he actually gained on it. Their quantitative estimates, the average over all the physicians, those who want, said it got better and worse, was 42 minutes of lost free time per, per day, per clinic day. Now, the things that were slower were nothing. 10% of the guys said nothing was slower, so that's good. 24% uh, said writing prescriptions was slower. 32% was the inbox function was slower. Now, the inbox function is that the emails and all the messages that come in, and the, the women at, at the clinic the, who got upset with me, that was one of the biggest things. That, that just, they never got done with the, the inbox. Reading the notes from other physicians was 32% it was worse. You know what? You know, that should be easy. You know, it's, it's electronic and you pull it up. And 35% finding and reviewing clinical records was worse. 40% ordering and scheduling tests was worse. And writing visit notes, 64%. That I understand. And we all kind of understood that that, that would be the case and it was worth it. Um, now, um, <clears throat> The problem with the clinical stuff, we actually asked for a lot of open-ended questions in the survey, and so they wrote a lot. And we can't prove anything by it, but the common theme was that the reason why the notes were bad, were harder to read, because they were junky now. You know, they got the cut and paste phenomenon, just piling stuff in. Some of the templates went on forever with stuff that no one really cared about. I mean, maybe you had to ask it, but you would have been summarized in a more, in a fully human note. Uh, there was wrong stuff. They, you know, they just copied it, cut and paste from some time before, and it really wasn't true anymore. So that was sort of a surprise. And then the free text comments about the reading clinical things. I think it was mostly, again, we just could. Some guys elaborated and some didn't. Had to do a scanning, and uh, well, one guy said I have to type in all the lab results. Now that's insane. We got HL7 for 20 years. What in the heck are they doing that for? Uh, 20, uh, so, but, but the problem there was they're, they're sticking in scan notes without labeling them with computer labels so they can't find them. A lot more people say we, it's very hard to compare the previous with the first. The fir you can't line them up. They're not giving them flow sheet. That's dumb. I mean, we've known how to do that for 20 years, you know, some of us old timers. But, but there's, and then 20% said the system was slow, down a lot. One guy said it's down a quarter of the time. Whew, that company's going to go out of business, but we, we won't talk about the companies that did that. So, um, so I've said all this already. So, Houston, I think we may have a problem. You know, <laughs> this is not. This is before meaningful use two, which is asking them to do more. And I don't know what they're not. Physicians are not allowed to strike. So, but they might, you know, go to the streets like you know some of the other countries. You see pitchforks, you know, torches and stuff like that. Uh, so survey results indicate that EMR can reduce efficiency. We had counted on it for improving efficiency, and by golly, we got to get more efficient in healthcare if we're going to re reduce the cost. Um, so the implication for health information exchange, if you do scan documents for the only way, then, and I talked to someone last night that they do label them, you know, get a date in there. The date it's scanned can be two years ago. You know, I mean, I mean, they'll scan it today, but it's an old record. That just doesn't work. And you got to label them at least by section, you know, x-ray reports or some darn thing. Because in the paper charts, they were organized that way. So you could find them easier. But the other option is that you should OCR anything you scan in. And if you build the right system, you still might be able to find everything by searching for words. Because they're not, those OCR is pretty darn good on scan stuff. Um, for under MU2, now another perspective, only laboratory tests are required to be delivered in a structured report. And this, this just frustrates me no end. I mean, we want to get a whole medical record. That's, that's the first, that's the prime directive. It should be, because we can't do any of the other stuff until we do. So uh, looking at laboratory accounts in Medicare Part B in 2011 for $7 billion worth of cost. So that's going to be great when we get it in. But they're really fairly, 50% have to be from hospitals and only numeric and coded yes, no kinds of tests. So the, the result is you can get 50% with like six tests. You know, your CBC, your analysis, a couple others. And if you don't put in the tech stuff, you're going to lose out the impressions. So you're going to get, you're going to get cheese, you know, cheese, well, Swiss cheese records. So I hope they'll get more aggressive on that. And there's not even talk about chest x-ray reports or EKGs. Or, and they're being sent around hospitals. They, you know, they could use the same approach. You have to make sure you got good codes in there is all you need. At least that's my theory. We'll never get past the big barrier of interfacing costs if we leave so much out of the record. And before we get on to these more exotic things, let's finish the first job. Um, so I guess I've said that already. Um, CDA could fill some of the gap. Uh, it does include medication lists, important text reports, discharge summary, and coded names for a lot of things, but not everything. Some of it's pretty vague. 
Uh, and some of it's hard to figure out. So we got one example of a CDA and we're trying to put it into a system we have. And when you get down to the description about where the SIG is for the prescription, you ca it's in this general text box. And different people are using that for different things. And, it's, and what we found in the SIG field was all the drug prescriptions concatenated together for, in one SIG field. It ain't gonna work that way. So it's gonna take a while and hopefully there'll be some attention given to these tune-ups. It just needs a tune-up. And I actually complained about it at the HL7 and they may have got it tuned up. Uh, H CDA, the other problem is how is it gonna get to the physician? We know it's gonna get to the patient, but how is it gonna get to the physician? It's not, it's not detailed. And we still are stuck with the thing, we need an electronic record for the physician if we're gonna get any benefit out of this stuff and then you can get spin-offs from that. And you give all the stuff to the patients and kind of on PHRs, they're gonna pass them on, you're gonna get down to 5% of them dribbling in and, it, and no one's gonna care when it's that low. Um, so uh, meaningful use requires more note writing work than is currently required. So all notes must be text searchable. I think, I gotta be careful, this is tape, isn't it? Well, I won't say this, I'll tell you later. But no handwriting is allowed. I don't know if that's a good idea. Uh, and providers or licensed health care must do the note writing in order entry. And you can't use a, a scribe, although there's a little bit of an opening for a scribe, which was one escape valve for some of the processes. For transitions of care and consult notes, there's extra work. Functional status must be recorded, including activities, daily living, cognitive and disability status. I don't know if that's a bad idea because there's some well, but they haven't specified this, the ones to use. You'd like to get them picking one or two and not saying do what you please, and it's not clear it'll be coded. Uh, and care plans, that, that's not a traditional part of physician's notes. So this is gonna be another 10 minutes per patient or five minutes per patient, so I, I mean, I worry. Um, these goals are based, and some of the goals of all this good stuff about medical record notes, I don't know any study that proves what use they are. I mean, I'm sure they're of use, because I use them and you read them. But you know, when you think about visit notes, when they go to the first visit, you know, he might have this, he might have that, and then you get all the tests back and it's settled. That's where the meat is in most clinical care today. And then certainly those repeat visit notes, patients doing well, blah, 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 blah. You know, if those are just handwritten, and you know, the physician themselves can read it, and actually the writing isn't that bad. I know of three studies that show it's no worse than average writing. It just looks worse because they write in code. You know, they say things that aren't real words. Uh, so I think, um, and many, the record originally was notes to self. You know, I mean, what do I want to worry about? Where am I going on the patient? And we're putting all this expense into it, I worry. Uh, so time, provider time is a scarce resource. Uh, I think entering prescriptions and orders is absolutely right because there's so much leverage off of it. You can send them off, you get the patients out of the room quickly and all that. But I think we should rethink the requirements to enter all notes in a formal fashion. But that's a radical thought, and don't report this to anyone else in the government that I said this. Uh, and note writing needs more study. We really should invest some money in studying it. You know, how often and what parts are ever read? Who, you know, is, what, what is the, are the minimum facts that are necessary? And you were talking a little bit about how we ought to focus down on those key things, and I think they'll be happy to put that in if it's proven. Glasgow Coma scores go in, EPGAR scores go in, you know, in all records, because that's known to be useful, and it's easy to say it. And when does the, con con the content obfuscate and when does it communicate? And there's papers suggesting it obfuscates a lot and they're, they're listed here too. So that, that's all I have to say, just more pretty pictures and thank you for your attention.